Pardon. Okay, so today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we have author and compost tea, Sophie Strand. So how are you today? <laughs> I am okay. I am enjoying that there was spring bird song this morning. The days are longer. I saw some crocuses. Like I feel that there is an energetic shift, but it's been very necessary. What about oh, yeah. you guys? <laughs> yeah, the uh, spring has is starting to sprung here too. And it's, it's wonderful. It's a little colder today, but <laughs> yeah, it's cold here today too. Yeah. Yeah. We've been letting our ducks and geese wander around the yard and get all the fresh little bits of grass that are coming up and they're just so happy. Yeah. <laughs> so that makes us happy. <laughs> so how, how is your spring so far? What, who, what are the, what are the beings you're interacting with? You said, uh, crocuses, mm. and songbirds. My spring is a little complicated. I am very busy and very ill. And those things usually necessitate being inside. And yet I'm a person who gets most of my, you know, juice from being outside. So I'm not quite, I, you know, I think maybe on an, another year, I'd already be like on the mountain and spending most of my time hiking. But this year, it's a little bit more like, you know, a leisurely stroll through my neighborhood. But this morning I was graced by two bald eagles that flew right overhead when I went outside. Um, what? So I, see them, I see them a lot. Like they're honestly kind of pests in my area. Like they're just a lot of them. Hmm. But um, I do always get this thrill when I see them um, fly right over the river where I live. Yeah. Um, what animals and critters are, are you spending time with right now? Well, um, mo where we're doing maple syrup, so mm -hmm. plant more plant, but we, yeah. uh, we, we did a little hike the other day and found a bunch of red belted polypore, which is, oh, wow. Yeah. Mushrooms. And, uh, we're, um, boiling down the sap with mushrooms in it. So we've got like, uh, oh, that's the, a great idea. Yeah. The, the chaga and the reishi and the, uh, turkey tail and the red belted polypore. Um, those are, those are the beings we're spending a lot more time with right now. Yeah. Yeah. And we, um, we've been hanging out with our hawthorn patches, mm. we have like a huge hawthorn tree. This is like a grandmother tree. It's the biggest hawthorn yeah. I've ever seen. Um, and it's just so grounding and so magical to be in its presence and just hang out there. So we hung out with the hawthorn a little bit. Um, and I was noticing on the woods walk, like all the little like spring greens there's like the virginia water leaf is creeping in and the garlic mustard and cleavers and chickweed are starting to like emerge um so it's really finally beginning this is sort of the time of year because we're like two weeks behind where you are in yeah, the hudson yeah. valley as far as our our climate and zone <coughs> excuse me and so this is the time of year when I start seeing on social media, pe people posting pictures of their crocuses or the daffodils and the spring flowers coming up. And it's still like mostly covered in snow where we are. So I'm yeah. just like, I'm going to take a little hiatus from social media for a few weeks here until we catch up because I don't want to see it. <laughs> so, well, I feel I, you know, we had a snowstorm like just last week. I mean, things have been, we don't have daffodils. We like, we got, we got crocuses yesterday, kind of. Um, just picking up. <laughs> yeah. I, I bought myself store-bought daffodils as like a kind of like, <laughs> you know, a wish fulfillment. Oh yeah. No, I was, I was thinking that I always feel a, a real energetic shift in my body and like that it needs different foods and different herbs. And I've been looking at what's coming up to see like what I need to ingest, like mm, if yeah. the, the nettles, yeah, the mustard green, yeah. like the chickweed. Yeah. Those are definitely things I've been like, okay, I need to eat those. I need to like introduce those into my system. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Spring tonics. Yeah. yeah. That's the way. Uh, yeah. Our I guess we're pr probably on a similar schedule right now this year. Um, it kind of depends on year to year, but yeah, I'm so excited to start getting all those, those early spring greens. We have a lot of ramps back here. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah. All the garlic mustard and chickweed. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. So we have a traditional first question on the plant cutting podcast and it's how did you come to the plant path? Hmm. And we, we know that you're more of a writer and a, you're inter interested in like mycology and uh, myths and so on, right. but you know, you could take it as a, you know, I, I mean, I've 
plant path. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've done herbal apprentice trips. I mean, I, I considered myself, I've always loved plants. I, um, really like spent so much time with them growing up. My English grandmother was kind of like a gardening witch. Like she just like intuitively knew how to grow everything. Mm. And towards the end of her life, she moved in with us in our home and puttered around and like took care of house plants and our garden outside. And my mother was, we, we grew up on a, you know, relatively ample plot of land in outside of Woodstock where we had geese and ducks and, and oh, really? we, we, we tried to grow our own food and we had flowers and herbs. Um, and so I grew up with plants real, knowing pretty intimately, like, you know, Woodstock is a pretty hippie-ish place. And I grew up with a lot of homeschooling, artistic herbalist, you know, parented friends. So I always knew that plants healed you that they were your friends, they were alive. Um, so like, I don't know if they're like, I was introduced to that. It was part of my upbringing. It was like an intimate yeah. part of who I was. I do think that the real turnaround came when I became very ill with the, a genetic condition I, we didn't know I had kicked in when I was 16 and I became life-threateningly ill and spent quite a bit of time inside the medical industrial complex in a way that didn't heal me or fix me and was very traumatic. And coming out of that, it was really, I think the plant path for me was realizing that, okay, there were no fixes for my condition and the medicines that the pharmaceuticals that I was getting used as like a test rat to test because my condition is rare, the drugs are experimental, you know, it wasn't making me feel very good, but I could have a very close relational experience with plants and with fungi mm -hmm. that did give me symptom alleviation, did help me and mm -hmm. I could help them. Um, and so I would say that the plant path has been, I think a lot of people say this is, you know, it was me looking for some type of healing relationship that didn't go just one way, but that, you know, was opening up a vein of communication with another world that was very generous and flexible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I, I got very interested in herbalism. I did a very complicated herbal apprenticeship with a very complicated person and, you know, made my own medicines. I've never wanted to be, you know, an herbalist for hire. I've never wanted to pursue that past the point of me learning how to make medicine for my own family and for me, but it is something I care really deeply about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's really cool to hear about your upbringing and um, yeah, your relationship with your relationship the with the plants. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. They're they're just so generous. Um, I've learned so much from them. Like speaking of the hawthorn, like just so it's the hawthorn tree is so giving of its berries, and you know it's just like here dropping berries, and here is my flowers in the spring for all of the insects. But they also have these boundaries too of their like giant thorns. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing is I, I love making metaphors and learning. And I honestly think that, you know, I was inside of academia and this very Eurocentric male dominated idea of how you get knowledge. But the truth is like, you learn so much from just watching a plant for a year and thinking oh, yeah. with it and alongside it, like learning with invasive species is something I'm really interested in this. Like, what are you doing? Like we have very simplistic ideas about what you're doing. What are you really doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. What do you think they're doing? <laughs> oh, I, I couldn't hesitate. I, I, could, I couldn't say, I mean, I think they're working on scales that far um, out measure the human and the span of a human lifetime. I am interested yeah. in how the, cl the climate is changing very fast and if the climate is changing, then the conditions for certain types of ecosystems are also shifting. So invasive species for me seem must be playing some kind of role in that shifting of ecosystems in towards more resilience and adaptability inside of chaos. Mm. Yeah, I definitely agree. It seems like looking back at the history of ecosystems, there's periods of everything being reduced to a few numbers of like very generalistic uh aggressive like easily adaptable species and then yeah. and then periods of still where they like you know adapt adapt to all of these different niches and then they're diversify but i yeah. think yeah in a period but for the human mind like <laughs> <laughs> you know that that period of time is you know human history is just just a snap of the fingers mm -hmm. oh yeah just a drop in a huge ocean 
Mm -hmm. I know. Um, it's so important for us to know that when we start thinking that we can control and understand like ecosystems and whole webs of kinship, I want to be like, you know what? <laughs> we have not been here very long. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think about like knotweed, Japanese knotweed as yeah. an example of what is referred to as an invasive species. And it's like that plant, I've seen it pop up through the floor of a house, you know, it's, it can break through concrete. So it's like, when we no longer have oil and cars and road, like no need for roads, like the Japanese <laughs> knotweed is going to handle that. It's going to break up those roads and, you know, exactly. Yeah. Press in that way. And even right now with like the, the Lyme disease and the amount of ticks that we have, you know, it's been proven very helpful for, for treating Lyme. And it's like, it's there for us and we're mad at it right now, some of us, but it's like, again, generous. Exactly. So yeah. No, the knotweed is, is definitely something I think about all the time. It's, you know, I always think of Audre Lorde's, you know, imperative, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Invasive species seem like not the master's tools. They're like this Dionysian anarchic throwing the party outside the city's gate kind of way of, of digesting empire, digesting this extractive mm -hmm. colonial, um, so, yeah yeah at the, the same time I really like how you put that <laughs> yeah. like i'm not gonna plant not weed in my garden mm -hmm. oh yeah no you know and in fact <laughs> these i think these things don't want to be planted they want right, yeah. to, to follow their own tides they, they kind of are very like anti-neolithic it's funny mm -hmm. like so i, I totally. wrote two books about one book very strictly about Rabbi Yeshua, the figure who becomes the, you know, the Christianized Jesus. And then I wrote another book where the figure of Yeshua was an important aspect, this flowering one book of essays. And if you actually look at Jesus's teachings, they're all about invasive species. Like the kingdom is, is, is a mustard seed. Like that was the worst invasive species to Galilean farmers at the time period. Like, uh -huh. you know, like the kingdom of God is here it doesn't like your agriculture and it's going to take over your field, which feels pretty crazy to me. I love that. Yeah. That's an amazing metaphor too. When you look at it through that lens, I mean, like when I was taught as a child being raised a Christian, yeah. your faith is big as a mustard seed, you know, it's a tiny little seed and they'll grow into this plant. They didn't realize, yeah, it grew into a plant with thousands of seeds that will then take over an yeah. entire field. <laughs> you know? yeah. Destroy your wheat. Yeah, destroy the wheat that you were growing so that you could pay the taxes to the Roman Empire who has colonized your land. So it's like very relationally constituted and very complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we, it's so easy to miss the nuances of those, the ancient, you know, teachings when like they've been translated several times and the whole co cultural context has yeah. been. Yeah. That's I just like learned. Thing. Yeah. What were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say that I just learned you could make um, like an oil out of pressed mustard seeds. Oh, wow. that got me thinking. It's like, well, we right, right now I use a lot of olive oil and a lot of coconut oil in my home and to make my herbal salves. And I'm like, thinking about what regional oils I can use. And so I'm like, well, mustard seed, like that's a great way to, you know, kind of use this abundant plant that's like growing everywhere. So I'm like putting that on, on my list of, of things to research and to do. Huh. I would think it'd be really labor intensive. I'd be really I think interested so. yeah. in how to do that. Yeah. yeah. You would probably need a lot of <laughs> uh, mustard seed, a lot of gathering. It's, yeah. yeah, no joke. But if we don't have access to the coconut. Yeah, here, I know. Exactly. It's like I got time. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah. hazelnuts, hazelnuts might be a good. <laughs> Maybe hazelnuts would be good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or sunflower seeds. Yeah. Um, well, and this, this ecosystem too. Mm -hmm. It's good. For, yeah. But yeah. Um, speaking of, you know, your books and your writing, like what, what, um, how did you get into writing? Has this been something that you've always done or um, what inspired you to, you know, put pen to page? Well, there, it's a multivalenced answer. One, my parents are writers okay. and are friends with lots of writers. So I, was, I grew up in a writerly community, mm -hmm. um, but I also had a predisposition to writing. And as a survivor of early abuse, um, stories were 
like a survival mechanism for me. They were something that I, like saved my life. And then I was like, well, if they saved my life, I'd like to make stories. I'd like to make really good stories that could save someone else's life. Mm -hmm. And so I think when, you know, when you, when I peel back all of the culturally imposed narratives of what I'm supposed to want and what I'm supposed to do right there at, you know, this, the pith of me is like this seed of wanting to create stories that are as, as nourishing and as life-saving as the ones that nourish and save me. Um, so I've been writing since my parents were really supportive. You know, I, I wrote thousands of journals and children's books and stories. You know, I wrote like a 900 page fantasy novel that I revised eight times when I was like 12. Mm. Um, I wrote fan fiction, I wrote poems. I actually like put myself through college with a lot of the poetry prizes I went, I won in high school. Um, and studied writing in college. Um, so writing has always been the through line for me. And I think that I've always been most drawn to long format historical fiction, like mm. using, like creating ecosystems rather than these monomythic, sterile, like 200 page, you know, literary novels that get, you know, churned out of MFAs, they're popular for a month and then no one ever reads them again. Like I wanna create like books that are, you know, biodiverse that have different plants of smells and textures and, and complex relationships that are constituted rela by relationships, not mm. by heroic individuals. And so I always, always wanted to write long format books. And after college, I was supporting myself by ghostwriting other people's books and doing a lot of freelance editing and ghostwriting mm. while writing my own long novel. Um, so like you don't make money when you're writing your own long novel. So you got to like have a lot of odd jobs. And I finished that novel right like a month, finished the revisions on it and got an agent for it the month before quarantine began. So like it looked like there was going to be this really natural transition from writing other people's work, hiding behind other people's names to publishing my own book. But quarantine scrambled the publishing world scram scrambled my own life I got a bunch of rejections there were a lot of constrictions in my life like professionally socially like physically like there's a lot going on mm. and I started writing this nonfiction, and as a kind of like just trying to connect with people like I had no belief that it would sell that it would be a book or anyone would want to read it but that's mm. what got the attention of the publisher that bought my book and then bought my other book. So I've been doing quite a lot of nonfiction and have two books of nonfiction essays that are really focused on myth and storytelling and ecology and mycology. But th that was not the writing that I thought I would ever do, which is a strange thing. Yeah. yeah do, you guys, do you guys have writers or books that are um, pricking your attention right now? Uh, yeah, <laughs> always. <laughs> uh yeah well i've been reading i've been reading um we just read gordon white's animistic that's what i was yeah. sent that to us and that was a that was really nice before that um well i read hamlet's mill which is about yeah. like, all of the myths in the world are from like astral lore which <laughs> it's like not it was written in like this early 70s and it or maybe late 60s yeah it was like the 60s it was kind of a slog, <laughs> but it was really interesting to see things from that perspective. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think it's totally correct, but yeah. One that stands out that we both recently read was this book called Sastoon. Oh, yeah. Huh. Um, by um, Rosita Arvigo. Rosita Arvigo. Who we and, interviewed, and yeah, she was amazing. Right. Okay. Yeah, and that was, um, it's a story of her experience going and learning from a healer um where are they again in belize belize, belize. in yeah. belize and um he's this elder in the community and he's like a spiritual healer and it's just like a beautiful story that weaves together you know the plants and the angels and like the magic and the local healing. society yeah. and the traditional healing and it's so it's like a nonfiction story that reads like a novel and it's really, really moving. It was also That's really amazing. interesting to, yeah, yeah. It, was, huh. it was really amazing to see how 
like a traditional healer functions in a community too Mm -hmm. because like yeah like from like a european perspective or american perspective like we look back at people and like have ideas and like witches or Mm. cunning men but like this is a living part like he was alive until like 1999 or something and he he like he he was a traditional mayan herbalist and and spiritual healer and see how those were naturally interconnected and integrated Mm -hmm. into a community healer Uh, yeah Yeah. giving a plant without a prayer is not gonna work (laughs) you know for him and it was yeah 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 so that was yeah i i was also when you were talking about uh your getting published i i have i've heard that there's like an 80 20 rule with publishing where like 80 percent of the submissions are novels or, or fiction and 20% are nonfiction, but 80% of the books published are nonfiction and 20% are fiction. I don't know if that's true, huh. but it would make sense that fiction, nonfiction would be easier to publish maybe too. That's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure if that's totally true. Um, I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen those numbers. I, it's, it's an interesting thought. Um, I think that a lot of fiction gets published, but it's a lot of a very particular type of fiction. Oh. Um, and in fact, if you decide to write a certain type of book, a certain type of fiction, you will get a book deal. Mm. But um, there's a ki- it's a kind of deal with the devil situation. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, publishing is also a lot of nepotism. It's like who you know um who you know because a lot of things go to the slush pile so it's it's a complicated thing my parents have worked inside publishing and they're also published writers and i've worked on all the different in lots of different modes of publishing so i've seen you know behind the scenes and and i knew it was always going to be hard um but i got i'm getting published now in a very non-traditional way which is the publisher approached me, which rarely ever happens. Um, oh, like it, I had an agent, but it didn't happen through the agent. So it was interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I found you, I uh, think from like social media, like it seems like you're kind of blowing up there. Like your, your writing is really uh, attention grabbing. Like it, it draws you in. Uh, at least. Thank you. Thank you. I think I see people sharing it, like people that I are from totally different mm. corners, you know, that don't know each other. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So that's, I mean, that's pretty cool. Is that, is that why you got approached or like, um, for, or did that happen afterwards? I, this time last year, I was sharing these initial essays that are now in revised finished form in my book, The Flowering Wand. I was just sharing them as I was writing them on social media. I had like maybe a thousand followers on Instagram and Facebook, like nothing. And within like a month, I had like 5,000 more people on both. Um, Like within like in a very short period of time. Oh, cool. Um, And I was sharing that work to stay alive. Like I had received pretty terrible medical news. I was quarantining alone. I've been doing it for a year. It was like a really, like, it was a moment where I was like, why not share this work? If I'm going to die and never be published. Like, why not like create some funky, weird, vegetal, mythic work and see if other people vibe and, <laughs> yeah, <we do. laughs> share, and share it for free. And mm. so I've always been really inspired by Amanda Palmer's uh, idea of, creating community by sharing your work and risking being changed like risking showing your work in process Mm -hmm. and having it be like in like a conversation rather than this like solitary like saintly activity yeah um and so I started sharing but then it sporulated it was funny because I was writing about fungi and then it like started to really behave in this fungal way which is like just like all of a sudden I was like being asked to do things in England and Australia. And I was like, what is happening? (laughs) Um, And so I I do really think that like my readers are like my fungal system. Like they're like branching out their hyphae. They're like connecting me with people I would have never known about. And Mm -hmm. it's been really magical. Um, Yeah. My publisher found me via the social media spoilation that happened. 
I, I'm not a person who loves social media and I'm also kind of a really private person. So this was a really out of character thing to do. And I think what people don't see on social media is how much effort it takes for me to like continue doing this. Mm. Um, I think that I'll probably pull back once my books are published. I'll like take a break, but it, it's been incredible to like see my words just like connect me with amazing people like you. And it's like, how? yeah, wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, putting yourself out there um, in that way can be, you know, kind of scary. Um, yeah. And taking the leap, I'm, I'm just so glad that you did that. Um, and thank you. Yeah, and that we get, you know, to benefit from reading, reading uh, your work. Um, one thing that that stood out about something I read was the story of the Golden Rose. Hmm. Yeah. And I was wondering if you would tell the story to our listeners. Sure. Uh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I will begin this by saying the Hudson Valley is a wild place. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have any wild time loop, fairy, or magic stories, please share them with me because I'm always collecting them. They're amazing. So yeah. many people have them. All yeah. you need to do is get people around a table with candlelight and a glass of wine, and they'll relax like all of their ideas about what's possible and they'll share their story. Um, <laughs> uh, the gold rose story is I was, I went to Bard College um, on the Hudson River and it's a pretty wild area in terms of you know legends and lore it's like a right around the rip van the, the the place where rip van winkle is supposed to happen and a lot of people report time loops been a lot of ufo sightings but i had been through i was young i'd been through a very tough week i'd had an abortion my boyfriend had broken up with me and the abortion had gone wrong Mm -hmm. um, it was like a really intense moment. And I was feeling it's like at that point in my life, I was very good at compartmentalizing and being like super chill. So like, I don't think anybody knew that I was like not having a very good time, mm -hmm. but, um, I was out at this bar that was infamous called the black swan and black swan events are also these rare events. So it's so funny, like all of the different like little aspects of it I was at this bar that was infamous for, for serving underage girls with a bunch <laughs> of friends. And I was drunk and we were all drinking. And at midnight, all of these plainclothes officers took out their badges and created a giant sting on the bar. And it was like chaos. And I was thinking like, you know, I'm a person who really cares about my academic record and my like, you know, <laughs> at that point I was like, really wanted like everything to be very sacred and like not blemished by, <laughs> you know, some weird rep police report that I had been breathalyzed and drunk underage at a bar near my college. Yeah. And, but there was like no way out of the bar and we were freaking out and all in, in the midst of this insanity, this very unremarkable looking man turned to me and said like, you've been having a really hard time. I think you need this and handed me a gold rose. And I, things were so chaotic that I just like took it, turned, turned back, he wasn't there. And then I was like struck with this like divine um, insight and like took my friends, pulled them through the kitchen and we crawled out through this window. We got a cab and we escaped. <laughs> and it was like crazy. I was just like, I know how to do this. We're gonna crawl through this window. Amazing. And, um, but when I got back, I realized like, no, this isn't a spray painted rose. Like this isn't like, I, I had thought it was like some like, kind of shitty thing you give a, you know your girlfriend on valentine's day that you buy at like some store but mm -hmm. this was like something really intense it was really heavy i had jewelers and like welder friends look at it like it was really hard the detail was so fine super hard to know how it was made um like i'm i'm a person i'm a believer but i'm also curious like if, if i could figure out how it was made also no one knew who the guy was couldn't find out who he was my friend had seen him too and also had no idea who he was. And so it was like all of this, I love that it was like magic within the language of, of my life. Like, like he didn't look like an elf or a fairy. He looked like a very average person. Mm -hmm. Like it had happened within this like sting on a bar. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary, but it was also what I needed. It was like this like sign to me in this very tough moment that, you know, there's always a trap door. There's always an open window. 
Like there's always magic well beyond your ability to explain and, you know, reduce and understand. Like the rose has been such a great thing for me because it's also a good litmus test with like friends and lovers. Like I remember my long time partner, we were mid move and he knew the story of the rose. And I remember he was looking at the rose and he was like, this is probably worth a lot of money. You should just sell it. And I was like, this relationship is doomed. <laughs> so yeah, that's the story of the gold rose. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is amazing. Yeah. Really cool. Um, and it's, it's also really interesting that you like still don't know how it was made. And it's just like such a special, special thing. Still a mystery. Yeah, yeah. it's still yeah. a mystery. I love, mysteries. love me too <laughs> and I just love that it's it's a rose it's like yeah. and roses you know tend to bring us right to our heart and you needed that heart healing and yeah. then you also needed to listen to your heart and be like let's get the f out of here yeah. <laughs> you're out come on girls <laughs> yeah I love roses and my parents write a lot about roses and the history of them so it's also like yeah lots hey. of there. yeah cool yeah, I'm also curious to have a little like candlelit wine session with a bunch of Hudson Valley people and hear their stories because there's so many myths and legends. And I've definitely felt that vortex that, you know, draw in the Hudson Valley when I've been there. Have you guys had any crazy experiences? Um, <laughs> in the Hudson Valley? Well, I haven't been there that much, so. <laughs> um, generally, you know. Well, I've had... I don't know. I've had, um, can you, hear, can you hear our geese right now? Yeah, I can. I, I love it. I grew up with geese that were like my, my pets. So yeah, I love yeah. it. They're, they're really mean right now. They're in their like adolescent <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, mating season maybe. phase. Yeah. Um, yeah. As far as like wild experiences, um, I've definitely heard some stories of some of my friends who have had some wild experiences and I've had some like I remember one time just had this really crazy like visual experience when I was hanging out with my friend at sunrise, like looking at the gunks in New Paltz, like uh, his his face morphed into a golden dragon um, mm. when I was just looking at him in the sunrise. It was like a green and golden like dragon. Um, and so I feel like sometimes with the Hudson Valley, that's like the veil is thin or you like can like kind of yeah. see things that are like not as easy to grasp when you're in this, this like more normalized mindset. And so I feel like when I've spent time in the Hudson Valley, I'm like able to access some parts of beyond the veil or like parts of my own mind. Um, so that's, that's just the first thing that came into my mind when you asked that, but have you had any other? Well, like the ones I can think of right now, and it's always funny is like, you know, afterwards I'll think of more, yeah. but yeah. involve yeah. people other people that I don't really want. I don't know if I should share, you know, yeah. also I haven't had enough wine. So <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's also, you have to be careful. Like I, I, I actually was saying this to someone else. I've had a lot of wild experiences that I don't feel like I'm allowed to share. Yeah. yeah like, that, that like they were sacred experiences and I'm not allowed to extract meaning from them and like widely share them but like yeah right I mean there, that's a common like uh, thing that people say from lots of different traditions about mystical and spiritual experiences like you know, shouldn't really talk about them necessarily you know like even from like you know uh Eliphas Leve like the fourth the fourth rule of magic is to be silent yeah <laughs> or well, like yeah, Odin on the yeah, it, the, the sacred, you, you can't look at the sacred directly. You have to look at it obliquely. Like there's, there's something, it, yeah. you know, it's, a, you know, the mysteries, like the, you know, you're not supposed to say what happens in a lucis. Mm -hmm. Elus I never know how to say it. Yeah, well. <laughs> Probably know better than I do. I, oh, <laughs> yeah. I just read Apuleius, the golden Oh, ass. I love the golden ass, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that was really good. It was, um, what's his name? translation the white goddess i was gonna say robert graves yeah yeah his translation yeah. that yeah i that I, ju I just read that like last week and that was amazing 
but he also he straddled that line between what you say and what you don't say <laughs> exactly yeah no and that's why we don't have all this information about mystery rights is because you're not allowed to they're yeah. supposed to be like experienced and embodied like yeah mm, totally that that does bring us to something else that um another topic of myths like in stories yeah, yeah. what like what is a myth to you and, and are they living or are they like ossified, <laughs> ossified uh, <laughs> in books? <laughs> well, I, th I think that written culture has existed for a relatively short period of time. And for right. most of human history, storytelling has been a participatory adaptive event. It happens, it's always adapting to shifting groups of people, climatological, social pressures, and it, they're always, you know, teaching you how to live in right relationship with the precise ecosystem where you are. Like the myth of one place will not be easily transplanted into the soil of another place. You know, so what we have these days are stories that are deracinated, they're uprooted, they're translated into different languages. And then they're, of course, they're not nourishing to other cultures because they weren't made to suit those, you know, specific assemblages of plants and animals and people. Um, I think for me, myths are reproductive flourishes of um, archetypes and of beings that live underground. They're, they're the moment when um, elemental beings, when, when land um, urges, need a human mouth to speak. Mm. Um, and for me, the great example that I use is, I, is myths as mycelium, as mycorrhizal systems, which is we see these stories that emerge through human speakers or we see these mythic figures like Dionysus, like Theseus, but what they really are just mushrooms that look superficially like individuals, but are actually connected to a much deeper, older system below ground. And of course, like every time a myth fruits above ground in our social world, it's going to be particularly adapted to the time period. The mm. problem happens when you think that a myth can stay the same and then <laughs> still be relevant. So what I'm trying to show is that myth needs to constantly be cycling, that we've stopped the cycle of fruit and then decay. That if we look at the vegetal gods of the Mediterranean basin and gods and goddesses in general, you know, they go through processes of being alive and then they die, they're mulched back into the ground. It's important to have the fallow periods, mm. to have the compost heap, the moments where you throw things that didn't work, things that did work and see if something new can sprout. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, what I'm trying to give myth back is its flexibility, um, its orality, its relational um, aspects, and also to say that, you know, I listened to a theologian, an experimental theologian I really love recently, and she said, it's not useful to say God is dead if he's still operating. <laughs> so, and which I loved, which is, it's not useful to try and throw away you know, patriarchal Christianity and problematic religious structures, if they're still operating in science, in politics and culture, like, and in fact, they're more insidious when we call them by different names. A lot of modern science is actually articulated by Christian theology. And a lot of people don't understand that a lot of the, the modes of thinking that we consider scientific are just rearticulated theology with different yeah. terminology. And so it's really important actually to not just try and throw away this stuff, but instead to compost it, to say what works, what doesn't work. Can we replant the story of Jesus back in Galilean ecology and political context and see what it might've been really telling us? So for me, I work with three tenants, which is myco, eco, mytho. Myco being like, what are the relational constitutes? Like, things that constitute this myth like what are the plants it's teaching me about what it was teaching me about a certain time period a certain way of being a spiritual paradigm and then the eco is about thinking about what how it could be teaching me how to interact with my um, actual ecosystem like I can't transplant that myth into my own world but it could be, teach me something about how to be in conversation with the kin around me and then finally, mytho is about that, that aspect of, of creating something new, that storytelling is always arriving through us. And it's not about human stories. It's about providing an instrument for more than human music to play through you. So that's how myths get made, is <laughs> by being an instrument. 
That's mm. Maybe I mean that that's what I'm working with is mm. I love metaphors and the and the truth is if I if I mean what I say I'll say something different tomorrow because what I'm saying <laughs> is everything is always changing. Yeah. Yeah. That it, it talking about how myths are so dependent on the ecological context yeah. uh, is really I, I think that is really important. Um, but it's also as we started out this conversation with a little bit difficult when the ecosystems are changing at such, to such a degree. I mean, like, like I could go back um, and, and I think it is important to learn the myths that were in the land that you occupied yeah. for me, where Ir Iroquois, uh, um, Onondaga uh, peoples, but also the, the land has changed since then too. And like, so it's, all, I mean, I also like re I've been immersing myself in like the Northern European myths, but like this, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> those are also from a different place. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, how, so how do you, how do you, um, yeah, make myths that are relevant now? Like, do, do you think that like, I mean, I haven't actually watched, I don't think any Marvel movies, but I've seen people talk about Marvel movies as like the new myths, you know? But I don't really know if I don't know if those are if that's true or not. I want. I guess it kind of depends on how what what happens over time and what it, what what is picked up and what is discarded. I think Marvel movies are made so that they don't have to be, a, they don't have to be responsible to any ecosystem or language. Like they're actually like I was talking with someone who works in movies who was saying they're made so the script doesn't matter so that they can be mass produced to many different countries mm. so so that like you know like it doesn't really come down to like cultural markers or language like it's very easy like there are some subtitles but that's not it's more visual mm. it's supposed to just be like an event and so i think that that the marvel movies are almost like anti-mythic they're yeah. like they're 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 part of more of a kind of like a monologic like monotheistic idea of like can we create a homogenized universal idea of heroes mm -hmm. and and they're very wedded to this idea of a hero's journey uh, of of superhumans who save you save everybody um which is what i'm kind of trying to problematize a little bit how do we create new myths i i think new myths will be very humble i i, I mean i i think it's <laughs> and, and, and i i think that i can't even tell you i mean i i think I think myth making and storytelling needs to shift from being more about telling and more about asking and needs to become more interrogative with where you live, which is we've done a lot of human storytelling and the time now is to ask for stories instead of always telling them and thinking about how best to tell them. Mm -hmm. And so asking can look like a very passive place and it can look like not writing and not telling and not making. And in fact, during this time of quarantine, I think that's been an, an invitation, which yeah. is, and I've tried to take it a little bit, which is to just like do the same walk 400, 500 times and mm -hmm. see what wants my attention, you know, and, and to ask it like, and say, okay, what, what are you trying to tell me? And to start using my whole body as a listening receptacle. Like mm -hmm. maybe it, the story it's telling me is gonna register as um, a taste, as a feeling, a prickle down my spine, a certain kind of sensation that I always get. Like, how can I learn to ask for stories and for myths? Um, and I, I, so I think I always wanna be creating a questioning curious type of relational myth-making. That this is not going to be about us telling new stories, it's gonna be about us weaving new connections. Mm. Yeah, it seems like a lot of myths have parts about how a certain geological feature got there or a certain plant, why yeah. certain plants like the way, the way it is. So maybe it's asking Japanese knotweed, where did you come from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think I, I, I like will ask to dream with plants and fungi. I'm mm -hmm. like, give me dreams. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's common across many different cultures like you know the vegetalistas in south america and even like i always love you know if you look at a lot of the stories in genesis in the old testament it's a lot of plant dreams <laughs> mm -hmm. and like you know joseph of egypt is like dreaming about wheat and plants and like that's actually his main attribute 
um, <laughs> is as like Genesis vegetalista. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think asking for dreams from fungi, from animal animals, from ecosystems, from landforms is a really powerful thing to do. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Kind of brings up um, a question about fungi. Like it seems like the relationality is really important and like the mycorrhizal connection that fungi create, you know, is something that you're really drawn to. And I'm wondering if you can just speak a little bit to fungi in general and like why you're drawn to them and what you love about them. Um, well, this could be like four hours, but I will <laughs> condense it. <laughs> I love, love mushrooms. I always have. I grew up in the woods. I was fascinated with them. Um, I liked that they inhabited this kind of capricious, anarchic position between good and bad. Like there were dangerous uh -huh. ones, there were good ones. Yeah. They were associated with fairies. I was always attracted to them. Mm -hmm. um, and in college, I became very interested in mycorrhizal systems and also rhizomatic philosophy through oh. Deleuze and Guattari. Yeah. And trying to kind of like compose Deleuze and Guattari with like actual ecology. Like I was yeah. like, this is like, for all of your rhizomatic thinking, this is like very arboral. Like they're always like talking about like arboral thinking versus rhizomatic thinking. And I was like, this is very heady for what you're talking about. It, and, I had the same thing happen when I read Deleuze and Guattari and then got into permaculture. It's like, yeah. Right? Michael Rizal, that makes sense. Everything's connected. And it's, yeah. <laughs> No, it, se it seemed like it, but I was, as I was getting fascinated in mycorrhizal systems, and at that point, there was like not a lot of accessible writing about it other than like really dense science papers. Mm -hmm. I was finally diagnosed with connective tissue disease. And so it was this wild moment where I was like, I have connective tissue disease and I love the fungal connective tissue of ecosystems in the soil. And what I can't fix my disease, it's incurable, but if I wed my wound, to the struggles of an, another kingdom of being, this could be more interesting. Hmm. And so, which is what I'm always trying to share, which is your pain is a portal into connection with something else's story. Hmm. Um, and it's not about, you know, getting solipsistic and self-obsessed with healing yourself, but thinking about how your particular sorrow is pointing you like a compass out of the human. Um, and so the fungi did that for me. They, they reoriented me out of my own particular suffering and struggles. And they've done that. I mean, the thing I always offer is there are millions of fungi and we've identified just like a tiny sliver. So there are many different fungal stories. I'm very interested in a couple of them mm -hmm. and mycorrhizal fungi being one that really, really fascinates me and how plants didn't have root systems mm -hmm. that when they drifted from the sea onto land, it was fungi that acted as their surrogate root systems for millions of years and taught them how to have roots. Mm -hmm. So I think they teach us a lot about how being is never a solitary event it's always collaborative mm -hmm. um and that if we're trying to root into place it's going to have to involve collaborations with other species wedding ourselves to other root systems um so fungi for me are an incredible way to think through almost anything and i love them um mm -hmm. i love them so much and also because they're mycorrhizal systems which are the below ground filamentous structures of that then felt up together into above ground mushrooms they they don't have a distinct cognition like they don't have a brain like their cognition is dispersed and you know if if that cognition is flowing into orchids and grasses and trees like where does the mind end so they blur the the self line the species line the gender and sex line they're very sexy. So yeah, I could go on and on, but they've been life-saving for me. They, I, I, I saw that point of connection between my own connective tissue disease and their own function as connective tissue of ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And that's really been a very helpful um, frame for me. Yeah. So beautiful. Thanks for sharing all that. Yeah, I love the fungi too. <laughs> Do you have a favorite fungi? hard to say um reishi and lion's mane um are probably some of my favorite um but that will change you know it changes <laughs> season and with you know what's going on with me but um yeah I, I think reishi is especially amazing 
Me too. I mean, reishi is such a healing, um, healing fungi and it's adaptogenic qualities are just like magical, like wizardly. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We mentioned earlier, uh, did you mention that we're we're putting mushrooms polypore in our maple syrup? And I feel like that's such a, yeah, reishi is one of the ones that we're, we have in there and feel like it's, um, really complimentary with the maple. The bitterness and the sweetness really does. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good combo. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about reishi, like going into a hemlock grove Mm -hmm. by a creek, like a, that, the, the dark red forest floor of the needles and the, and the red brown trunks of the race of the hemlock and the openness. And then that red, dark red, brown reishi coming mm. out of a decaying hemlock log. It's just, there, there's like such a, a, a feeling about mm-hmm. that whole ecosystem, that little uh, ecological niche, that hemlock hollow mm. <laughs> and then the, the yeah. creek sometimes would be kind of red <laughs> i i love that yeah there's a reishi tree on my friend's property that we, we call it the reishi tree because it like it's decaying but it sprouts these incredible like sunset lacquered reishi <laughs> um, yeah um i love it i love it so much and it was funny at the start of covid i started taking a lot of it um because mm. i i had a feeling that it was going to be good for my immune system and I've oscillated in and out of taking it and found it to be very helpful mm-hmm. yeah I'm, I'm also liking the red belt of polypore a lot mm-hmm. lately that's when I kind of my I mean it's been a couple of years but it's still it's like one of my new favorites uh-huh. <laughs> it has a red belt it's variable but the red belt it has a resinous that if you decoct it there's like a re- resinous resin <laughs> there's a resin to it mm-hmm. and it, it's it's just bitter and it's different than reishi, but I think it has a lot of the, a lot of similar, uh, compounds. Yeah. Yeah. We actually just got into making mushroom powders last year Uh and we, we learned it from Dr. Christopher Hobbs, who's an amazing herbalist doctor and mushroom fungi expert. And, uh, we've been adding that to our smoothies and on oatmeal or putting, you can put it in like soups or things like that. And it's definitely something that we're going to be making every year from here on out. It's quite a process. You have to cook oh, the mushrooms yeah. in a sludge slurry, blend them, and then dehydrate that sludge and then blend them again. With the coffee grinder, <clears throat> like grind them. Yeah. Powder. Yeah. <laughs> be a powder, you know? Be a, That's be a wild. Powder. Then you get um, all the fiber. But and, yeah, then you're, and, you're ingesting yeah. the fiber. So it's like, instead of a tincture tea, um, where you're getting a lot of the constituents from the fungi, you know, you're also getting the the fiber from them, which they offer so much fiber and, yeah. you know, our, our diets are often really lacking. In yeah. fiber. So it can be a really great way to take them. So that's been a new fungi thing that we've been really fired up about. <laughs> it's almost mushroom season. It's, it's almost like we just need a couple of like 50 degree rainy days. Like I'm so ready to get out there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's one of the things I like about the uh, the red belt of polypore. We were hiking yesterday. So it's a perennial conch. And uh-huh. so it's alive right now. And if it's over freezing, like it, it's still, it's like alive. It's there. You can harvest it. You can, it's, mm. you know, awake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I like those, those uh, early, sp- like early spring and late winter mushrooms too. Like um, the, the jelly, fun- not the, not the jelly, the uh, which I call it witch's butter. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I like that too. I, I there I had some of that just raw. But the <laughs> the the um wood ear too. That's mm-hmm. also one of those. Yeah. And it's more more popular in like Japan, but it's kind of got a weird texture. Good in hot and sour soup. Yeah, very good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um yeah. there there is one thing I'd like to to go back to the topic of myths. Yeah. Um what do you think about like contemporary myths like so for instance like the myth of progress of like technological progress leading to like a star trek future (laughs) or like other myths that we don't recognize are give give uh contemporary culture you know industrial civilization meaning but we don't recognize as being a story (laughs) we just think of it as fact yeah yeah like do do you see any other myths that were like operating 
with well, I, I I think I'm really interested in the idea of egregores, which are like oh, yeah. you know beings that come in in you know group through mind. kind of collective group mind, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also I so so I I, I think. We have to be careful with, with with how interchangeable we use terms. The way I think about myth is very um, it's very informed by the way that indigenous cultures use myth, which is it's yeah. it's oral. It's teaching you about right relationship to land. It's it belongs to a people and a people in a web of kinship that uh, you know overflows the human. So I think you, we use the term myth of progress, but it does you know progress isn't really. Uh, you know, an, an ecologically situated cultural um, uh, right. cultural way of understanding how to be in right relationship with land. I think it's much more like an egregore or much more like a morphic field. I'm interested in Rupert Sheldrake's idea of patterns of, of behavior that the more they happen, the more they're likely to happen. And mm -hmm. that they're, they're you know, they encompass wide swaths of space and people and so it, I, for me it's interesting to think about something like neo-darwin darwinianism progress capitalism as being like this egregoric field that it the more it's been fed the bigger it's gotten the easier it's become to think it's very easy to think inside of these things these days so they're fields we think inside of and it's important to acknowledge and problematize them rather than just pretending like they're not there um, but I would hesitate to call them myths within my own personal terminology. I would say that they're more like fields of behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause people really do have different understandings of words, especially words yeah. like, like <laughs> for some people, you know, myth often in our contemporary culture just means like something that's wrong, something that's a false. Exactly. Story. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, that, that, that makes sense too. I mean, in it, so one one um, way that I understand myths is a phrase from uh, Sol Solust, Solustius. Uh, myths are some are a, something that is always true but never is. Beautiful, yeah. You, um, and so in that perspective, well, yeah, I, I guess like even studying the myths that, that the way the way I have been, it's like they are often divorced from their ecological context, like most of, uh, almost all of them. <laughs> So it's hard to, so that's the way I'm used to thinking in terms of them too. Like, like what are the stories telling me from an archetypical perspective? We're looking at all the different levels of them, but I think this, this way that you're suggesting of looking at it primarily as an ecological story is really important and is a really interesting way of looking at it. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm also, I'm going back to myths from the lands of my ancestors, not places I live now, places I visited, but don't live. And I think for me, it's always important to acknowledge, like, these are really interesting stories, but they're not necessarily teaching me how to be present and in right relationship with the Hudson Valley. So, yeah, yeah I, I think it's, it's, either, it's never, it's always both. It's always either or like, um, I mean, yeah, you have to be able to straddle your ancestral relationship to stories and then your need to tap into the elemental information where you are. Yeah. So what are some of the ways that you learn how to be in right relationship with the ecosystem that you are in now? Like, That's a constant, just as you said, that our ecosystems are fluctuating really intensely. That's a, that's a really constant negotiation. Um, I mean, I think that my answer is decidedly unsexy and simple, which is just spend a lot of time where you live outside noticing and being in relationship. And when you notice that something's changing, ask why it's changing. Um, and I think that there are really practical ways to do that. Also, if you feel like you have a hard time, which is find a sit spot, go notice um take herb walks take fungi walks you know indigenous lore and information the problem is a lot of it is fetishized and translated through um you know imperial language so it, it's hard but if you can actually get in touch with indigenous elders and communities that's a really good way of doing that um so I, th I think there's so many different ways can you look up local history can you it, also science is you know, science is framed as opposed to this type of information, but they're actually, you know, Robert Bringhurst, the poet and translator of Haida myths often says um, that science and um, myth are not opposed. Myth seeks to explain nature um, 
through um, metaphor, like element, like through elementals, and science seeks to qu- explain nature by quantifying it. Like they're both like filled with a similar urge. So I also love to read scientific page- papers about the geological formations, about the properties of plants, ab- all about studies of certain ecosystems. Um, so I think there are all sorts of different ways, and I also really how to be in right relationship right now when everything we do is kind of destructive. It's, you know, it's about knowing that we're always culpable, that, you know, every time we turn on our car, we are contributing to, to death on a massive scale, but there are also small ways that we can contribute to the general aliveness. You know, can we help protect a certain plot of land from being developed? Can we convince our neighbors to let their, um, their lawns, um, grow so that the butterflies come back. Mm-hmm. Can we notice that there are like what I was just thinking about this event that happened when I, I noticed that the um, snapping turtles that usually laid their eggs had come and laid their eggs and they hadn't hatched. Mm-hmm. And I like they just never hatched. And I went and dug them up and they had just died in their in their eggs. And it was, I had to find out that it was because of this chemical that had been released into the Hudson River oh, no. that had then gone into the soil and had thinned the eggs that hadn't let them properly develop. And so I think it's also about following those relational webs so that you can learn that like, you know, you, you think you're divided from the pollution in the Hudson River, but you're not. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I, I think it's about like, just like you can follow a hyphae from a mushroom to a tree, you know, it's a following those webs of relationship and, and seeing what they have to teach you. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it speaks a little bit to what you were saying earlier about um, being humble and like listening. And it's like, maybe our, our place right now is not to just like speak and tell the stories and offer like all of these things to the the land the spirits of the land the animals and plants and things around us maybe it is just to like be humble to listen and to understand um one thing i'll add is what you guys are doing i think is the best thing which is okay how can i be medicine to the land and make medicine from the land and learn how to create that circuit like i think that's one of the best ways like you guys are making myths like <laughs> you're weaving <laughs> yourself in and uh, like and can you learn how to forage wild food and protect, you know, wild food where it's growing, not over harvest it? Um, yeah. Well, thanks. Cool. Well, um, we're pretty much at our hour and um, we would love to just make sure our listeners know about your books, your writing and where to find more about you. So if you would love to, if you can just tell us about yeah. um, that, that'd be great. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you guys so much for, for having me. Um, thank you. Yeah. I have two books coming out in the next year. My first is The Flowering Wand, Rewilding the Sacred Masculine. It's available for pre-order on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, whatever, you know, cursed place you would like to order it from, <laughs> it's available from. Uh-huh. Um, and my eco-feminist reimagining of the Gospels, which is a historical fiction book, of Madonna's Secret, will be out next spring. And if you want to keep up to date with this and all of my many, I, I try and offer a lot of free writing. Um, so I'm always posting new essays and, and new things in the meantime, so that I can keep thinking and keep agile in conversation. So in the meantime, before those come out, you can pre-order those. You can follow me on Substack at sophiestrand.substack.com. Follow me on Instagram at Cosmogony, C-O-S-M-O-G-Y-N-Y. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and also visit my website, sophiestrand.com. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. It was a great chat and we are honored to have you on the show. So thank you for taking the time and sharing your heartfelt wisdom with us. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank <laughs> you.